It's working. <laughs> I see chairs being pulled out. That's a very good sign. Uh, and I'll wait for that. Um, and we'll start in a minute. There are also still some free seats in the middle if you want to squeeze in. There's an unlimited number of chairs in the back. <laughs> So welcome everybody. I have the distinct pleasure to wel of welcoming you to today's event. Uh, my name is Katharina Gnad and I'm responsible for uh, the work at the Bertelsmann Stiftung that deals with the European economy. First of all, I would like to thank CEPS, in particular Cinzi Alcidi, for joining forces with us in presenting this study uh, here in Brussels. We really appreciate it and I think this is sort of the beginning, let's see, uh, to sort of talk more, I put it sort of diplomatically, talk more about the future of cohesion uh, in the upcoming months and years. So this study that we are presenting today, and you see a sort of screen and you see all the co-authors who are all uh, here today, and I'm, I'm very happy that you all made the way uh, from different places in the world to Brussels today. Um, so what is this study all about? Uh, Professor Pierre-Alexandre Vaillant, uh, from Utrecht University and the Artificial and Natural Intelligence Toulouse Institute. It's quite a mouth mouthful. Uh, he's, he's one of the co-authors and he will talk through the study in a second. Um, so he will tell you much more about what it is, what we found out, what the policy implications uh, might be. Uh, before we then discuss it with you in the audience, but also with an excellent panel that is chaired by Cinzia Alcidi in a, in a second. But let me tell, me tell you a little bit about the motivation uh, of this study very briefly. We at the Bertelsmann Foundation started thinking about the future of European cohesion uh, and regional economic development uh, in earnest about one and a half, two years ago. And we have done a lot of work on uh, sort of trying to find out, uh, well, sort of doing studies on the future of the European uh, economy and on cohesion and cohesiveness uh, of the EU. However, we realized pretty early on in this project that these new mega trends of greening the economy, of digitizing the European economy, um, pose a huge challenge uh, to all our lives, um, but also to, the Europe, uh, to Europe's uh, economy as a whole. It has a deep impact uh, not only on how in Europe, uh, well, in the EU together, we face competition uh, at the global level, but it also has a deep impact on the regional level and the local level and the local economy. It has an impact of how we uh, produce uh, value at the local level, but it also has a deep impact on how we as Europeans in our regions, in our countries, uh, perceive this twin transition and, and what Europe in effect does for us in order to master this twin transition. So what this study focuses on is the technology-induced op opportunities for European regions to both shape the twin transition, but also to participate in its benefits. Um, so what that means for this prospect uh, is, first of all, a question of what it means for the regions, but it also has a big impact on how uh, it, Im well, it has a big impact on how Europe as a whole uh, is cohesive or non-cohesive at the end of it. So what interests us at the end of the day is whether this twin transition and adopting the, the technologies, producing these technologies will make Europe more equal or more unequal when it comes to their opportunities. So without further ado, I would leave the floor to Pierre-Alex to present the study and I look forward to this, the discussion. And you can already start thinking about some questions because there will be time for questions and answers. And at the end of the event, there will also be a short reception to which you're all very welcome as well. So the floor is yours, Pierre-Alex. Thank you so much, Katrina, for the nice introduction. 
Um, so let me tell you that uh, it's a huge challenge to summarize this study. You have a copy here, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 pages, huge challenge, especially if you ask an academic, you know, we tend to go really over time, but I will try, try to give it a shot. So can we please start a deck? Okay, fantastic. So uh, what we do, basically, uh, we look at the geography of the twin transition. So we basically start uh, this uh, and try to understand this question from the technology angle. So we're not talking about technology adoption here, we're really talking about technology creation. And that's something which is really important because the green market and the digital market will be huge in the future. And if you also want to shape the, the way we do AI, the way we do green technology, it's really important that European regions take a lead here. So we have this tech angle. And uh, the first thing that we, we found looking at basically the geography of technological capabilities in Europe, if you look at the map behind me, and this shows basically you know, whether European regions have more tendency to be really, really good at digital technologies in blue or green technologies in green. What you see here is that we don't have countries. You, you know, I, I challenge anyone to find country borders here. It's really looking at technological capabilities in the twin transition is really a regional issue. A regional perspective is very much needed. The second thing that you see is that we have a very strong heterogeneity of capabilities. So if you look at the level of green digital, you already have a lot of heterogeneity, but in the study, we go at a very granular level and looking at different type of technologies. We look at wind energy, we look at AI, blockchain, we look at broadband, we look at 5G, we look at very granular level of technologies and we find huge heterogeneity. And the challenge to actually accelerate the twin transition in Europe is to build smartly on these capabilities and acknowledge that European regions have diverse uh, set of, uh, of strengths and capability. And that's something we go very deep in the report so you can, you can find more information. Uh, what we do is we map these capabilities internally, but we also look at the potential for regions to connect better to create new technologies. So we look at the internal capabilities and in a way the external potential for better collaboration. And the, the key message of the study is that there is no really other choice, but there is no one size fits all. We have to build on this diversity of strengths, we have to map it and to build on this diversity of strengths to actually fully accelerate the twin transition. Now, first warning that we you know, uh, find in this study is a very strong risk of actually increasing regional inequality with the twin uh, during the area of the twin transition. So on the left hand side, you have in blue the potential to lead the twin transition in uh, digital technology. Uh, and on the, on the right hand side, you have the potential to lead the twin transition from a green perspective. And what you see here is very strong concentration of these capabilities and this potential uh, in, uh, in, Europe, in some re European region. We have a much stronger potential, actually, uh, a much stronger concentration of capabilities for the digital technologies than for the green one. But essentially, a big issue here, if you look at opportunities, so uh, this graph tells you a story of how related uh, different type of technologies, and here you have a, a little bit of an idea of the level of granularity that we have. So for instance, we look at biocide, advanced materials, smart farming, solar energy, uh, virtual reality, big data, Internet of Things. And we have a framework here where we measure relatedness, so for the more advanced regions, for the more developed regions in Europe, and uh, complexity of the technologies. So we look, we look at how these uh, technologies basically fit the existing ecosystem of the more developed regions. Okay, So uh, looking at the more uh, transition and less framework of the, of, uh, the, the cohesion policy, what we see here is that the, these, these technologies that are at the same time highly complex tend to be very related to the existing ecosystem of the, the regions that are the most uh, advanced in terms of economic development in Europe. What does that mean? That means that the regions that will lead the, in these technologies, they tend to be very highly concentrated in already the very rich uh, and, and developed region. So that's an issue. So we have this kind of relationship here where the most complex technologies, the ones that have the most potential for growth, they tend to be you know, concentrated in the regions that already have a lot of uh, potential. 
uh, when we look at now the transition region, so that was for the more, right, uh, developed region, and then if you look at the transition regions here, what we see is kind of a, a different type of pattern, where these most complex technologies, the one that, you know, can, can help you to capture a lot of value added, they are not very much related to the internal capacity of the region that are in transition, right? And that, that's an issue. Uh, and if we look at the, the less uh, developed regions, what you see here is that actually that was something pretty interesting that we didn't expect, but there is a little bit more of movement of, of these complex technologies, so that they are the ones that have the most potential. There is a bit of a movement here, uh, which means they tend to be a little bit more related to what is actually uh, being performed in the, in the region. And why is, is, that, is that useful? Because these are the, the technologies that you know, have the most potential for, for growth. Uh, and especially some technologies related to big data, IoT, uh, AI, cloud computing, they tend to be quite related to uh, the existing infrastructure and, and technologies uh, in, the, in the less developed regions. So essentially what it means is that, you know, to make it very clear, is that we have to be very careful that during the twin transition, we don't also accelerate inequality between regions. And to avoid this, uh, this issue, what we can do is actually to build on existing capacity uh, of regions to make sure we develop the technologies that best fit the regional ecosystems. Otherwise, essentially, we, we will run into, uh, into trouble. So this is, for instance, for uh, Ober Bayern, and you see that uh, the, the most related and complex technologies are here in this quadrant for uh, another region, which is a region in transition here, for the region of Centre, you have less of this capacity, but you have this frontier here where you see battery technology, for instance, drones, that are basically the technologies that uh, will offer the best potential for the region to develop. So that was the first, uh, the first idea. We have to be very careful that we don't increase the regional inequality during the twin transition. Now, uh, the second finding of the, of the study uh, that we want to emphasize uh, right now is that there is a strong uh, national bias in interregional uh, collaboration. So we know that, but the extent to which this bias exists is extremely strong in the twin transition. So if we look at uh, connections uh, here, these are the within country co connection in red and uh, in orange, the cross country connection, you see a completely you know, overarching uh, you know, pattern where regions in Europe tend really to collaborate based on the national uh, border. And uh, connections, you know, if you try to model that, can be explained mainly by sp spatial distance, so that's you know, something to be expected. The size of innovative activity, cognitive profile, but especially being in the same country. And, and essentially being in the same country you know, is three times as important as, uh, as the size of inactive acti activity, which is something we, you know, which is really a problem. And this pattern that we see here of having way too much collaboration within region basically does not match the existing map of capabilities. You know, if you look at the map of capabilities in the first, uh, in the first graph, you don't see uh, countries, you don't see borders, but you see borders in the, in the way uh, regions uh, uh, collaborate. So this is for uh, digital technologies here. In the case of green technologies, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's the impact is even stronger, so you see even more uh, red, essentially. And the big question is here is which connection needs to be, uh, to be targeted in, uh, in priority. So what we find is a very strong mismatch between you know, the actual linkages, the actual networks that you see between region and the map of capabilities. So here, this is for the region of Armsberg in the context of hydrogen. And you see here the complementarity potential of this region, which is here in red, with every other region in Europe. And what you see, very strong uh, complementarity potential, for instance, with Rhône-Alpes, which is in France. But if you look at the actual network of collaboration, you don't see you know, this, uh, th this connection anymore. So this is, if you want, somehow of, uh, an idealized uh, you know, uh, regional system of innovation, and the actual one you know, basically doesn't match. And this mismatch is a big problem if you want to scale capabilities uh, for especially very complex technologies. So uh, what we do, based on this uh, analysis, we compute untapped potential. Uh, in this case, also accounting for other variables that are important, like for instance, you know, size of the, of the, of the different economies. Uh, and essentially what we, we 
compute here is what the, this network will look like in the ideal world if you will not have this, you know, overemphasizes of country, uh, within country collaboration. So we, 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 we study that and you see basically the, 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 the maps of the ideal network, they look very different from what uh, the real network uh, is. And the, the green one, uh, in, the, in the green technologies, we see a little bit of uh, movement toward the, the south. Okay, so this is it for uh, the, the presentation. Uh, I have a summary slide here that I won't really discuss too much, but essentially, uh, you have this here, the, the finding of the study, three findings and uh, essentially policy implication. So I'm just going to read the policy implication really quick. Uh, no one size has fit all policy from both a regional and technological standpoint. Uh, we need to support a technological prioritization. This is really important. Effort of less developed regions so we can map capabilities and help decide, you know, basically where to invest. And this is the way, you know, to basically avoid uh, this increasing inequality, and we need to target and that potential to improve both the global EU leadership and EU cohesion. Thank you so much. So good. Um, Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, very welcome to, to, to this event also from, from my side. I'm Cinzia Cidi, I'm the Director of Research here at CEPS, and I'm, I'm really pleased to, to, to moderate this excellent panel. Uh, after the, the super interesting presentation made by uh, Pierre-Alexandre, uh, many thanks. It's, uh, I have a lot of questions in mind, so um, a lot of uh, food for thoughts, uh, no doubt about it. But uh, I'll retain my, my, my questions, and first of all, I want to introduce the panelists. I will start uh, on, on my left with uh, Ron Boschma from University of Utrecht and one of uh, um, the authors of, of this report. Then next to him, uh, Peter Berskovic is a, a director uh, at the DG Region, so uh, director general Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policy at the European Commission. And then last but not least, uh, Thomas Vobin is Director for Legislative Work at the Committee of the Regions. Uh, so welcome uh, to all of you and many thanks for joining us. Um, I'll go straight to the point with uh, some questions so that we also have the, the time uh, to, to get questions from, from the audience. And I would like to start with, with Peter. Um, Peter, one of, uh, of the main slogans of, of the Commission is no one left behind. And uh, I think this is particularly important when we speak about uh, the twin transition also in the light of what it was said just a few minutes ago and the fact that uh, the, the twin transition in practice could increase the risk of, of inequalities uh, at regional level. So the question is, how can we make sure that no one is, is left behind? And uh, more specifically linked to, to, to what we just heard is, uh, is inter-regional cooperation or smart specialization the kind of answers that we can offer uh, to basically mitigate or reduce this risk? Floor is yours. Right, well, first of all, delighted to be here uh, together with Ron, Thomas, and, and other, other colleagues. Um, just to an answer your question, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's absolutely clear, like any other major technological shocks, that what we see here uh, will lead potentially to significant inequalities uh, through the asymmetric impact that it's going to have. And this is something which we're already looking at in the Commission. I think what's really important about this piece of work is it brings a message that there are also opportunities. Uh, and I think that you know, that is the key policy issue, as you, you seem to allude to. And, and, the, and the question is whether the instruments we have uh, at the moment are completely adequate to address these. Um, and I think that, you know, the, you mentioned some of the instruments we have within cohesion policy. Um, we have smart specialization, but smart specialization has traditionally re remained very inward looking. I think we saw in Pierre's maps the national focus, but often we even see a very strong regional focus. So the question of how you create linkages outside region are, are posed. We have a new instrument, uh, which is the I3 instrument, which is focused on 
trying to build complementarities, but it's a very, very small amount of money, 570 million euros. So I think the real question is, you know, how would we scale up tools in the future in order to, to, to build on the potential? I, th I think we have to move away from a compensatory logic. It remains very, very important, but to something that actually builds on the potential of, of all the regions. And wh what I found very, very interesting from the presentation was it shows very, very clearly that d different types of regions have different potentials in different areas uh, and potential relative advantages. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like now to, to, to move to, uh, to Thomas and link to uh, the issue of uh, in interregional cooperation and the fact that basically what it was shown in the, in the chart is that uh, uh, this is essentially national. Uh, it's clearly not optimal, uh, or, but it's clearly national. How do you think, I mean, what could be the way to, to go beyond the national border if you think it's, it's, it's possible? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having, uh, having us here. Today is also, uh, we discussed in the committee the future of cohesion, future of transition, and we're very happy to be here. I speak on my own behalf because we haven't had a new position yet, but uh, work very closely with a lot of people. Um, yeah, we have a paradox. On the one hand, the, those who are most in need to, to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, cherish the opportunities do, uh, don't do it. We have an innovation paradox. The most who, who are most in need are the least who take up the opportunities. And uh, in the study, for example, there's a reference also to the locked-in regions. And there was a case made for a North and West failure for the rural area in the 20 years ago. And I think a lot of that is still the, sa is the same now. Um, if you, if you f only focus on, on within, and even within the region, within the country, if your cluster or your industry is only uh, inward-looking itself, it's very difficult to see what the cha uh, challenges in the future are. And in, uh, very often, those who are dealing with interregional are the exhorts in administrations, uh, and uh, they are seen as some, something as an add-on, not as, as an integral part to, uh, to ex execute. And um, the, we, we, we do not have a culture where we really embed interregional cooperation, outward looking, as part of, of our policy making, particularly also in the administrative space. For example, the European Commission is planning a communication on the European administrative space later this year. And my point would be, uh, cohesion policy is a huge administrative space in the European Union. We, we need to link administration and cooperation much more in order to make the internal, the internal market, the common market, really working for, for each of the regions. And the big problem we have, and Peter has said so, we have winners and losers in the tra transition. A lot of the uh, citizens perceive this coming from Brussels. We have next year European election. Uh, we have seen recent election that people are not that happy with the speed and the, op uh, the, 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 the changes. And there is too little focus on local solutions based on cooperation. And this uh, uh, program uh, Peter was referring to is very important. But it is has, it's very difficult to really engage in it if there is not local leadership ready for it. And we do not have enough local leaders, particularly in lagging behind regions, who want to bridge this and who want to use it, uh, use this opportu 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 uh, space of opportunities. They see it more as a space of challenges and threats to them. And that is the key issue we have also um, in how to uh, manage the twin transition, because we have to consolidate it in the next years in order to make it a success. Because it's seen in many regions, particularly in lagging behind regions, as a threat, and cooperation needs to be an essential part of it. But it isn't, isn't yet. It isn't yet. We haven't found the formula really to get regions cooperating in this way. And maybe the last sentence, the, the map is a bit misleading because it's on a nuts tool level. You look at certain technologies. My assumption is any region can cooperate with any regions if they want to because I in many cases they can also find new, new space and new markets. But of course, you have relatedness, you have complexity as, as key drivers, as success factors, but it's also more outward looking as a general uh, curiosity of the region to see what's outside. I would say is, is also an important factor and it's a very personal factor. 
and uh, lagging behind regions very often do not have business leaders who look outside. They are only implementing what some others have told them to do. And uh, very often also the c uh, political culture is very much focused on a defensive way of uh, seeing things and not a, in, 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 an uh, in a way of opportuni opportunity. Thanks a lot. If you, if you allow me, just um, um, a quick follow-up. I mean, I have been around in Brussels for more than a decade, and um, I have been uh, um, working on different policy areas. And uh, basically, what we are discussing today is somehow some sort of national bias. So in the linkages, also across regions, there is some form of, of national bias. This is something that we, we observe also in, in other areas, from financial markets to many different of uh, policy areas. So there is always the questions, what are the obstacles? So why is that? And usually, as an economist, you said, well, it depends uh, on the specific aspect at which you are looking at, and you range from language to uh, the knowledge of the institutional setting, that the fact that you have cooperate with another region in the same country in the past, and uh, you, you try to, you basically, there is basically some sort of inertia, which uh, keeps uh, uh, the, the same relations with, with the same partners. So how can we overcome this? Uh, which basically here yeah, the message is this is not necessarily efficient in, in terms of uh, um, network that, that you build, but uh, how to, to get beyond that. And what you mentioned in this administrative space, because very often is also linked to administrative burden or administrative complexity of going in another country, I really wonder how concretely we, we, we could leverage on, uh, on these new measures to go beyond the borders. Do you think it's something that it can really work or it's more just um, the usual blah, blah? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be <laughs> so explicit on, on, on this. Thomas, I don't know whether you uh, are... So, uh, so, sorry, you asked <laughs> me. Uh, no, of course, this happens. And uh, we have fantastic examples where uh, regions get together, develop an idea and a, a project. But um, uh, when you look at the triggers, what, what are these triggers for cooperation? Uh, they are, they are, you mentioned there is no one size fits all. There is not one uh, way to do. Of course, one key trigger is funding. Uh, and uh, that's where, for example, the European uh, r uh, Union plays a key role, bringing partners together on working. Um, uh, we, but we have to make the funding in a way that uh, it is not uh, um, uh, too risky to do. For example, if you have a 1 to 10 chance of winning a cooperation project, you will not apply for a really very important project for you because the chance to fail is so high that you are not doing it. So what you do as cooperation product projects is projects where you say, okay, nice to have, but not really essential things. So we would need to rethink the way how we trigger prom uh, cooperation. Also from the way of experimentation, from the way we deal with it when we look at state aid, we will deal with it. We have the IPCAIS, the, the proje pro project of European interest. We have to get more these kind of instruments in, in the connection to regions lagging behind. And then, of course, uh, uh, knowledge. A lot of the regions do not know what their position and their threats are. And I think your study, the study, is very useful for seeing opportunities, but also uh, in the other way, in the other direction where your, where your, 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 your threats are. And, and I think that's where we uh, collectively have to think of no new ways of working. And as I said, the European administration space, if you think it through, if, for example, uh, you could think that in a region you have as a norm also people from other regions to work together with you, you, you balance cultures, you uh, bring in an other networks, if that becomes a norm as a part of a training program and so on, we can also uh, uh, overcome this blocked inness. Of, uh, of many of the regions, and we call it now, uh, the new term is development traps, as uh, Ron, you, you mentioned <laughs> it. We have for everything uh, new terms. But there we really have to, and um, we have to uh, strengthen local leadership. And when we look at the twin transition, it is not based on local leadership. Uh, the twin transition comes very much once we have a joint objective, we make it legislation and so forth, and now we discover that there are big differences in regions. We have, in this, and that's what I mean with consolidation of the Green Deal, 
We have to build it on local solutions. If we don't do, the voters will tell us what they think about it. And local solutions need to be based on local abilities to do, and our help to help them to, to, to find these local solutions. Smart specialization is one way, but it's also peer-to-peer -peer learning more and more direct cooperation. And there's also one area which uh, I find very important. Um, we have multinationals. We have, for example, the chemical industry. You have big players there. They don't do enough to bring regions together. A BISF has sites in almost all European countries, but it treats each site as a competitor within the organization, and it doesn't use the network to bring the regions together. And I think that we have to overcome as well. I if we want to have more partners to work together, we have to go back from the islands and the islands of competition, the islands of, uh, and more to strategic cooperation in this field. And that is unfortunately not happen happening enough. Thanks a lot for this. I would like now to, to move to, to Ron, still related to, to, to this issue of, of cooperation. So um, it was mentioned that uh, funds could be an incentive for cooperation. This may be an incentive for poorer regions, but what would be a good incentive for more developed region actually to cooperate with those lagging behind? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, and uh, thank you for all being here and giving me the opportunity to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, yes, uh, what is the incentive of more developed regions to connect to other regions? Well, I think the study is very clear on that, is that there is a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, misalignment uh, going on, and that is also true for more developed regions, right? So uh, um, and that came as, a, as, as maybe as a bit of a surprise, but we can see uh, overall uh, that the regions make the, t the wrong type of connections, right? So they might connect, but not to the ones that, that can provide complementary capabilities. Uh, and this, I think, is an, uh, an issue, uh, and therefore an, uh, an, uh, an issue also for more developed regions to take up. So they, uh, they could uh, um, um, get much more out of their innovation process if they would connect to the ones that, uh, that can actually mean something to them. And and somehow they, uh, they, they are not able to do that. Uh, so this is, uh, comes very clear of our, our research. Uh, so there's a lot of unta untapped potential as we refer to it, right? So, uh, and this uh, is something uh, which needs to be corrected uh, because uh, what to me the European Union is about is to explore and exploit complementarities that uh, uh, exist across regions and countries within Europe, right? And uh, apparently, we are not doing that, uh, or we're doing that only to a very limited extent. So yes, to expose to the outside world, that, is often, that has often been referred to, uh, that we should do that. But uh, 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 what this study actually shows is that it is not just exposure uh, by itself, but that it matters to whom you link and, and who, uh, who can provide the complementarities that you need in order to develop new innovations that you target, for example, in your smart specialization policy. Uh, also, coming back to uh, previous comments, uh, a smart specialization policy already from its very beginning, starting in 2014, in their guidelines there was already a requirement that they should focus on interregional linkages and they should exploit that. And that has not been really taken up in smart specialization policy. Yeah? The, the regions were more focusing on local capabilities and, and to, to depart from that and to see to what extent there are opportunities uh, uh, to diversify and to move into uh, new economic activities. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, to link to other regions uh, uh, was not really an issue. Um, and what our study shows that it is maybe not so much connecting to somebody, but connecting to the right ones that can actually matter to you. So there is a very strong incentive for the more developed regions to do so, but we can actually see that they also have a lot of untapped potential, not connecting to the right ones, uh, but that might be even more true for, uh, uh, for less developed regions uh, because they might have uh, weaker capabilities and therefore they might rely more on interregional linkages. But then again, the same uh, issue, they have to connect to the ones that can actually matter to them. Right, so, and actually what we saw, and that was, came a bit of a surprise, I must say, is that less developed regions uh, uh, do so uh, uh, to a higher extent, relatively speaking, right? So, uh, uh, so and, and that, I think that is already a good 
uh, 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 starting point uh, so that they are aware of making connections outside their own regions. But then there is still the issue is, do they connect to the right ones? And that is what we observe is not ha really happening. And this is really a something which I find really disturbing in our European Union, right? So the Europe whole European Union, again, is about integration and, 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 and exploiting opportunities that are around in different countries within the European Union. And that means you have to connect to each other and you have to tap in knowledge that you don't have yourself. And this is, not what, this is not actually what is happening too much. Despite the fact that we have Horizon uh, uh, collaborative research programs. Uh, so I think also, uh, we talked already about, about what kind of policy measures could we think of. Well, this is something to start with, right? So uh, uh, if we develop Horizon uh, 20 uh, programs, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, partners, organizations can come up uh, with uh, uh, proposals and, they, uh, and they, uh, they form a consortium but then the, the issue is, who will be part of that consortium? Mm -hmm. Are there partners that can really provide complementary capabilities? So should that not be a requirement before you get funding in, in Horizon programs? Uh, uh, because you can connect, you can, you can, you can uh, come up with a consortium and you, go and you link to partners that you had uh, uh, a previous ties with in the past, right? Because this is, of course, what, what we know happens. This is also true in, in science. Eh? Uh, so, uh, so researchers uh, tend to collaborate with the ones they collaborate uh, uh, with in the past. Uh, but that might not be uh, an, an, a collaboration that really lead to something new. Uh, because at some point of time you know each other and you don't add so many new, uh, new insights uh, uh, in this collaboration process. So what we can do, and this is, uh, uh, and we could make that an important criterion for, for our Horizon uh, programs in the future, is that we actually select those partners and we only support those uh, 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 proposals that can actually show that the partners are well chosen that can provide the complementary capabilities in order uh, to uh, make uh, those uh, uh, consortium, uh, research consortia uh, successful. So uh, that Something what, what Thanks I a lot. I like quite a lot of your um, example of, of the Horizon uh, Consortium. But l let me go back to, uh, to, to Peter. So um, tomorrow the Commission will host um, um, an event, the, the, the Just Transition Platform Conference starts. Uh, we know that uh, there are some regions who, who are going to face um, a difficult transition. What do you think, what kind of message can, can come up from, from this discussion which could be constructive for uh, the stakeholders which will come uh, to, to, the, to the conference if you think that there is a good message to deliver? Well, when I reflect on the, the Just Transition Fund and the Just Transition Platform and the regions that are covered by it, I think the main challenge for most of the regions is one of diversification. Um, they've become locked into certain types of technology, certain types of energy systems, certain types of production systems. And I think you know, the, the type of analysis which is presented uh, in this piece of work is very, very useful for these regions to understand where their potential, their potential lies. And I think you know, the, the first thing is to actually understand what their real um, potential is, as opposed to the potential that they may think they have on the basis of political processes or what is fashionable. And I think this is the first condition. I think the second condition is, is and I think it's already been mentioned several times, this issue of capabilities. That without capabilities, you cannot leverage this, this knowledge. And this is particularly the case uh, in less developed regions. And it's capabilities in quite a broad sense of the word. It's the abilities of firms, uh, to understand the opportunities. It's the public administration's ability to project itself both within the region and outside the region. Um, but also, and I think this is something which hasn't really been said yet, but I think in policy terms is essential, is the capacity to mobilize external knowledge, whether it comes from the private sector, from multinationals, from, from EU programs. And, and in this respect, I think and Ron mentioned it, EU programs are very important. I mean, we have cohesion policy, which is essentially a funding mechanism, comes with a bit of, um, a, few, a few mechanisms, but we have other big policies. We have 
we, we have Horizon, but we also have all the single market policies, we have digital pol policies, we have environment and climate policies, what people tend to forget um, is that if you look at, um, at the climate area, uh, we have the innovation and the modernization funds. Um, there are lots of different, di different policies out there. So I think this reflection has to go beyond cohesion policy. And, and, and perhaps just one additional element which s really supports this is that we are um, living in a, in a changing industrial policy landscape. In a few weeks, months, the Commission will make a proposal on a sovereignty fund, uh, which will be designed precisely to, to strengthen production capabilities of key technologies, the kind of technologies that you, you are pointing to here. And there, the question will be whether in the construction of this new mechanism, uh, there will be something which takes into account the possibility of, of less developed regions to play their part as well. And I think that's one of the discussions which is ongoing in the Commission at the moment. Thanks a lot. Um, building on, on this uh, and um, uh, the different uh, policy instruments and, and the funds that are available, I mean, of course, cohesion is, um, is one, so I would like to, to move back to, uh, to, to Thomas. How can we um, um, keep cohesion policy relevant? <laughs> this is okay. Th this is a, qu a quite broad question, but uh, I think we are really speaking about uh, the twin transition, twin transitions so or digitalization, so innovation, so very much forward looking. Um, how can we make co cohesion still still relevant? I first uh, clearly define what challenge we have. And the challenge we have is that we have a huge modernization happening, uh, the twin transition, and we have collectively no clue, no clue what it means for each of the regions. We have six, seven big industries transforming at the same time, and nobody knows, is it uh, a building on each other, is it counterproductive, and so forth. Nobody knows. When Commissioner Breton was asked in the high level group or in the Route 35 working group on the phasing out of the diesel, and I don't want to go into that deal, he said, I don't know if it works, but we have to do it. And that is the big problem. So we, we have to do a transition where we do not have the recipe in Brussels how it will work for each of the regions. And we have to build on local solutions. What we have is a, an explosion of instruments. We have the Social Climate Fund, we get the Sovereignty Fund, we get uh, Modernization Fund, we have Cohesion, we have uh, RFF, and so on. And that is a disaster, because the regions lose completely the oversight. Am I on the right way? Do I use the right instrument? Do I have to please these people? Do I have to speak this language and that language? Because also we do not have one understanding, one joint understanding, how to deal with the regions. Ron, you spoke about opportunities. If we want to uh, release the opportunity, we have to trust the regions. We have to have one understanding how we work with the regions, and that is lacking. Um, and the second is we, um, we have every seven years one year where we have all the money in the world, where we need ideas, and once we've written our programs, we have no money at all, and everything is in procedures. We know already now when we need, when we have this year where we have all the money in the, in the world, and and where we need ideas. What do we do now to pr uh, prepare that? We need now to prepare the regions for this consolidation of the Green Deal, that we have the concepts in place when the next generation of the policies come. And we need to consolidate them. To multiply these instruments is not the solution. It is a weakness of the coordination, the lack of coordination at European level. And the second point is very important. Uh, state aid has been fundamentally re relaxed at the moment. We have all these instruments coming in. We have member states blocking final decisions at the very final stage. All signals, signals that we, our system is cr crack under a, a tremendous tension. These kind of actions you don't do uh, uh, easily. And this tension we have to uh, translate into clear ideas how we proceed. Because if not, then cohesion policy needs strong uh, competition policy. If competition policy is suddenly being totally uh, put on the market, it will have an impact on 
uh, those lagging behind. So what it shows, we need a fundamental rethink how this transition agenda, which is there is no alternative to this transition agenda, is being connected to the regions. We have this big mission approach where we say our mission is to be climate neutral 2035, but we have not understood, and that is not in the uh, philosophy so far, how to build the ownership on the ground that it has really been uh, seen as the mission of the, uh, the region, of the mayors. The mayors be very often seen as victims. They are not seen as actors. And if they are not acting, then they are not the first line of defense. Why is Europe doing it? And that is where, where, where and that you can only do with cohesion, with the principle of multi-level governance, with partnership, with a shared uh, management approach, shared responsible approach. And so um, w my point would be, rather strengthen the policy than creating all these different funds. And I would even say, why to have a social climate fund when we have social cohesion? When even in the social climate fund, it clearly says we need to take specificities on the ground in, in build. And, and uh, that is our problem. If we create for each thing something without thinking in a, in a, in an, uh, in a co coherent way, we, c we multiply the problems for the future. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, Peter, would you like to react? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, on, on which of the many points that Thomas made? <laughs> you uh, can pick and choose. <laughs> uh, no, no, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I think is, uh, I, I mean, the first thing I, I would say is that we have been living through extraordinary circumstances yeah. over the past few years, um, over the last two, two to three years. Um, you know, we, we uh, you know, we, I think we've had three out of the four horsemen of the apocalypse um, in one way or, or another, and we've had to react very, very quickly. Um, and when you have to react quickly, sometimes you, know, you, have to, you have to compromise and work in ways uh, which you know, bring unexpected consequences. I think what is clear for the future is that there will be a rationalization of, of the EU budgets and its instruments. Um, but the, the, the question is in, in which direction? And I think that is the open question because in a way which we have never seen before, we have a number of alternatives on the table. It's almost like a big laboratory. Um, we have the European Court of Auditors looking at everything uh, and drawing lessons and we will have to digest all of this and, and try uh, and, and do better. And I think, I think the Commission is committed to doing that. I think, I think the real question which I just say a word on is the question of, is cohesion uh, something which needs to be at the center of all of this? And I think that something which we haven't mentioned today uh, to a great extent is the, the political discontent that Europe is exper experiencing um, and the geography uh, of disaffectation with Europe, whether it's Europe or national administrations, it's not very clear. Um, but unless Europe is able to engage better, address the asymmetric impact, give the sense to people that they are not losers of the process of integration of the twin transitions, then, then we're going to be in trouble. And so I think you know, there, there, there is a lot of work on, on collectively on our table. Thanks a lot. Maybe back to, um, to, to Ron, maybe for, for uh, a final thought before I open the... Um, uh, the floor. Um, so this last round was quite a bit on policies. Um, in the in the paper, you draw some few policies. The first one is no, no one size fits all. Um, I think it's it's coherent. Would you like to to, to add on on this? Also, no, um, given what it was just mentioned about all the different policy instruments and the need for more coherence. Uh, well, I think uh, when we talk about cohesion policy, I think uh, what we should also uh, focus attention on is, okay, what are the opportunities of lacking regions, right, of less developed regions, right, because our report tend to show is indeed the twin transition uh, might increase income disparities across uh, uh, regions in Europe, so it will make richer regions more rich and poor regions, uh, uh, well, I know not more poor, but at least they will lag behind. But we also see some positive signs in the sense that there are less developed regions that actually have opportunities uh, uh, to participate in the twin transition uh, uh, technologies. 
and uh, 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 you have to be yeah, uh, following a one-size-fits-all policy, but you have to really target those in which each uh, less developed region actually has potential to do so, and you have to activate that uh, uh, sort of policy. So uh, I'm an optimist, uh, and I see, uh, I see lots of potential there. I can actually see that uh, uh, less developed regions actually have a high potential in green technology. So actually they can contribute to the Green Deal, I would say, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether a lot of people actually are realizing that. Uh, so our uh, uh, graphs actually show is that uh, uh, the, the less developed regions might not have that much potential in most of the most complex digital technologies, but they have potential in moving in all kinds of new green technologies, right? And, and, and some of them are even quite complex. So I think that is what we should have in mind. And uh, this is, I think, promising and could uh, contribute uh, to the green transition. Less developed regions can play a role in that respect. Uh, also, uh, um, when we look at uh, to what extent less developed regions make connections, as I said before, relatively speaking, they do more so than the more developed regions. So actually, they actually understand that they have to connect to the outside world, uh, which, me, uh, which means moving across their own borders uh, in order to exploit for complementarities. So uh, in that sense, uh, there's something to build on here uh, and, and, to, uh, and, and to expand on that. Um, so in that sense, I think I'm, pr I'm, 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 I'm pretty optimistic, but we really should target uh, those specific potentials that they have, not just in general, but to be very specific. And what our data actually show, and I think is doing a quite a good job, is specifying what type of green technologies we are talking about and which regions can actually mean something and contribute to that uh, 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 process of greening our economies. And this, I think, is a, is a very important lesson that we, uh, we, that we should take on board not only on in cohesion policy, but on, on, on green uh, uh, policy at the same time. Thanks a lot. And with this, uh, I would like to open the floor for, for questions. I see the two questions there, Jorge. Uh, thank you, Patrick Bissieri from the National Bank of Belgium. Um, just two short questions. Um, we have talked a lot about the opportunities for the less developed regions, but what about the transition regions, those that are more likely to be in development traps, if I take the cohesion policy uh, point of view. And the second one is that when I had a quick look at the tables in the annex, I could find that um, most of us, some suggestions of corporations were with the UK. So in the EU world, how do you realize that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm Megan Richards. I'm a senior visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund. I had a question. We talked about many, many funds and many actions. One thing that you didn't mention, uh, and it's easy to avoid mentioning the huge list of uh, activities, is the National Energy and Climate Plans, which theoretically, again, now at EU level, these targets have to be met at EU level, not just at member state level, which requires regions to cooperate. And one of the elements of those plans is to encourage better coordination and cooperation between not just the member states, but the regions. And then, of course, the trans-European networks for energy and trans transportation, et cetera, should also theoretically help regions to work better together. Uh, could you comment on whether you think those will help? Those are, of course, primarily green transition, but digitalization of the energy system is also a very important factor in, in that context. Well, thanks a lot. My name is Wolfgang Eichert. I work in the financial sector, and uh, my question is also from that perspective, because we've heard a lot about public money and uh, public funding, which is certainly very important at the early stages of innovations, but when it comes down to bringing innovations to the market and really make it grow and scale up, it's more private money that is needed for these processes. So. Uh, I don't want to open another discussion for an hour, so maybe if you could just allude on what you see as a major obstacle for private financing and maybe even a, solu a different solution. Thanks. 
perhaps just on, on the private sector, I fully agree. I fully agree with, with you. Um, and this has been a, a, a key issue for us. We uh, I have within our programs financial instruments. Um, and there, the, the challenge is really to mobilize equity in places where, which are either unattractive for the private sector or are low capacity. And I think that the capacity issue is an even more difficult one because we're not talking about the public sector, we're talking about the, the private sector. So I fully agree, and I think this is another one of the policy questions which we have to further debate. Um, Thomas? Yeah, um, fully support what uh, Peter said on transition regions. I think we, we ha also have to look at effective decentralization because what we can see also there is a link between is there an effective decentralization in place in order to make the regions really flourish and work. Um, with regard to the UK cooperation, we, we as a committee deeply regret that uh, UK is not part of the Interreg uh, family state in this, um, only with the Northern Ireland uh, peace program. Of course now with uh, involvement in Horizon and Horizon going local or more uh, place-based with the innovation policy, of course there are some opportunities. But when you look, for example, where are the experts coming from uh, uh, talking about cohesion, most of them come from the London School of Economics. And we are lacking, we are lacking really some think tanks more in, in, your, in the European Union dealing with this policy. And, and we are lacking this engagement with the British and with the American behind because uh, this is very where, where we have joint challenges uh, to work with. Concerning the instruments, a simple solution is if these instruments like 10T or the Climate so uh, Fund uh, follow the same example uh, built on partnership and multi-level governance. Cohesion policy is the only policy where these principles are enshrined in the legal framework. We have in the RRF lip service to engagement of cities and regions. We have only cohesion policy where this is. And in the last negotiation, there were member states who were saying this is an administrative burden. We don't need partnership and multi-level governance. We don't need a code of conduct. Totally wrong. If we want local solutions, we need to trust the local level with all the pros and cons. They are not better politicians, better civil servants than other levels of government, but we have to build on them. And, and enshrining these principles of multi-level governance and partnership in the legal actions is very crucial. And um, on the financial services, one problem is of course also fragmentation. In a lot of these, and capacity also of the financial institution in lagging behind regions. There is no risk taking mentality there because they do, they are locked in as well, and this is also a problem uh, getting uh, the financial instruments playing. The, luckily, cohesion policy has moved in this direction some time ago, but there is much more potential for the future. Ron, would you like to ask something? Uh, yeah, about the transition uh, regions, uh, I mean, uh, we, of course, in the, in the report, there is, uh, there is focus on the transition regions. Uh, we made uh, the, the distinction between the three types of regions, the more, the less developed, and, uh, and the transition regions. What is striking, I think, uh, and not unexpected, is that uh, you see uh, uh, for the transition region the most negative relationship between complexity and relatedness, meaning that in the, in the, the, the transition regions they have the, the highest potential and the least complex activities, right? Uh, um, uh, and this was even less so than uh, less developed regions. It came a bit as a surprise to me, to be honest. But non unexpected uh, also, uh, referring to the, the work of Graber, and, and lock in and the development traps. I think also we ne need to know much more about development traps. So, so I, I, I think that all also our work actually shows is that those transition regions are trapped in low complex, com complex activities and how to get out of that, right? So uh, this is, I think, a, a, a very important uh, uh, issue that we need to take up and it seems to be most uh, problematic in that type of regions. Uh, uh, given their old industrial past, uh, things like that. Uh, 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 they're already struggling for many decades to overcome that, uh, but apparently uh, 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 they still do so to some extent uh, uh, right now. Um, yeah, the collaboration uh, with the UK, I thought, th I mean, it would be interesting to also look at to what extent there is a Brexit effect, right? So uh, is, is, is it indeed uh, the case that we would uh, see less collaboration uh, 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 um, uh, between UK regions and, and other uh, European regions because of Brexit, right? 
I think uh, there's a kind of self-reinforcing process in this kind of <laughs> uh, 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 network linkages, so, uh, 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 so it might not uh, immediately show up, but maybe in the long term uh, it might go at the expense of collaborations between the UK and, uh, and, 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 and um, AU countries. Um, yes. Thomas, you want yeah, to go I just wanted to say on transition regions, it's also important to see where they are. And for example, most of the French regions are transition regions. So you have to link it, what I meant with the issue of decentralization. What is the national framework in which these regions work as well? Why are most of the uh, f French regions underperforming in comparison to w their potential? I think it's very important that this is also been picked up at European level. We cannot just simply say we pour money into it and then we don't challenge when there are systemic underperformance in, in that. We have the European semester and we would need to look into the European semester also what are you do with your territorial challenges. And, in a, and by uh, promoting this do no harm to cohesion, um, by, uh, we have research on unfunded mandates where tasks are given but not funding all these kind of things. I think that we need to have much more on radar if uh, to make the policy really work. It's too much dependent on things which are not decided in Brussels and we are talking too little about this, what needs to be changed at the member state level as well. Thanks a lot. There are quite a lot of questions but we are already over time. So I'm really sorry but uh, um, we will close the event. However, we still have some time, uh, so you can stay and uh, I'm sure that you can ask the questions directly to, to, to the panelists. There will be some, some drinks and some food, so um, stay with us and we can continue the conversation. I would like to thank very much the panelists, the authors of, of the report. I think uh, this is uh, quite interesting and, and policy relevant. There are some copies available, otherwise you can find it on, on, on the website and uh, you can share it with your colleagues. Thank you very much and um, have a good evening. Thank you.